Hi, everyone. <coughs> Welcome to the uh, last colloquium of this year. And uh, it's our pleasure to welcome Professor Rongchun Shen. And I think not too many people in this room can pronounce this. And so he goes by JT in abbreviation. And he's the, um, the DAS Family Career Development Distinguished Associate Professor of Electrical and Systems Engineering and Physics at uh, Washington University, another Washington University, but from St. Louis in uh, Missouri. Uh, he directs the quantum nanophotonics group. So uh, Professor Shen did his undergraduate in physics department of National Taiwan University, where I did my undergraduate too, but he's a lot, a lot younger than me. And then he did PhD in physics from MIT and was a postdoc uh, researcher at the electrical en engineering department and the Ginson lab at Stanford University. So in addition to quantum nanophotonics, his group also researches engineered optical materials. In the field of metamaterials, for example, he pioneered the mechanisms for the extraordinary enhancement of refractive index and optical nonlinearity and the operation of an ultra-fast optical switch. Professor Shen has received many awards, and including NSF Career Award, NSF Quantum Race Award, Bell Labs Graduate Scholarship, and Washington University Entrepreneur Award. So um, today he's going to tell us his idea about uh, using photonic dynamo in um, uh, some quantum systems. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, today I would like to tell you some of our work on a new quantum photonic state, the photonic dimer and uh, its applications. To start with, let's uh, take a look at the classical light. All our understanding about light and photons are entirely based on Maxwell's equation and the Schrodinger's equation. And uh, together with the, the deep understanding of light and photons, it makes possible an array of remarkable applications from, for example, antenna to lasers and uh, to optical fibers and also to optical imaging. And uh, very recently, some emergent uh, optically controlled quantum devices. Despite great success, there are fundamental challenges uh, in for, uh, optical photonics. And that include frequency conversion and optical bistability and the multi-photon absorption and the excitation, and the also optically controlled quantum photonic circuits. So at this moment, uh, all these nonlinear quantum optical, optical processes are either very slow or very inefficient. And the fundamental reason for this inefficiency is because of the very weak photon-atom interaction or direct or indirect photon-photon interactions. For example, for the frequency conversion, right now, by using a parametric down conversion, on average, for every 10 to the 10 incoming photons, it only generate one pair of entangled photons. So you know how inefficient it is. For the first two changes, so it turns out, people can overcome these challenges by using classical means. For example, in our group, we propose a mechanism to enhance the optical nonlinearity by orders of magnitude using an engineered optical materials. Uh, in today's talk, on the other hand, I would like to focus on the later two changes because these two are fundamentally quantum mechanical. So, and the, the, let's take a look why the quantum optical nonlinearity is so weak. So, it's uh, difficult to use photons to control photons. And uh, one of the prevailing wisdom is that because photons do not carry an electric charge, and uh, normally they do not interact with each other. Even in nonlinear materials, the photon-photon interaction remains prohibitively weak. So for example, just for fun, uh, 
it turns out photons can interact with each other at a very, very high energy scale. For example, at MeV gamma ray energy scale, the photon-photon can interact with each other by creating electron and the positron pair. Electron and the positron pair. And uh, by disturbing the vacuum, they can uh, have some kind of interaction with each other. But the cross-section is extremely weak. Uh, at visible light, at visible light, the cross-section is roughly 10 to the minus 70 meters square. So essentially it's zero. And uh, even the largest number, the largest cross-section is uh, roughly 10 to the minus three Fermi square. So that means in general, the photons indeed do not interact with each, each other. And that, is, that means in almost every application we encounter so far, in any optical electronic applications, what we use is the linear optics. The light do not, does not interact with, with each other, or the photons do not interact with, with each other. So, and that is the reason why in the previous slides, some of the nonlinear optical processes become so inefficient. So we discovered a new quantum photonic state, and which is a photonic bond state. It's formed by two photons, and that photonic state, as I will explain later, it represents the most fundamental quantum optical nonlinearity. And uh, this new quantum photonic state, it allows us, it opened up many, many new opportunities. In the following talk, I will briefly describe the applications of the new quantum photonic states. For example, it makes possible a two photon controlled phase gate. And it also makes possible of something that is, is uh, uh, similar to a quantum multi-photon excitation microscopy, which allows you to probe, uh, to uh, image, deep, to have the deep brain, deep tissue image, up to centimeter scale. And uh, I learned that uh, this week is the last week at the U of Washington. So with the spirit of the summer vacation, I will also provide some speculation on the possibility of forming a photonic liquid. Before that, let's take a look at the bond state. The typical bond states are always formed by charged particles. So the particles are charged, so there is an, an attractive force between them, either direct or indirect. And the, when we say something is a bond state, that means the relative wave function decays exponentially as the distance between the particles in, increases. And this bond state, they propagate as a single entity. And the bond state typically are the building blocks for many exotic, many body quantum states. On the other hand, the photonic dimers, the photonic dimers, which is the bond state of two photons, it, it characterizes by two time scales. The first one is the coherence time, which characterizes the uh, center of mass degree of freedom. Another one is the correlation time, which characterizes the relative wave function, the time scale. And so a photonic dimer, it has the following property. When you perform a coincidence measurement, then you will find almost for sure the two photons will always arrive together. And that means there's a bunching behavior for the photonic dimer. And like the typical bond state, these photonic dimers, the bond state of two photons, they will propagate as a single composite photons. And the, the most interesting feature is that once they are formed, they remain a bond state, and they can propagate in vacuum without the underlying nonlinear materials. And that it, because, also because electrons do not carry charges, so the binding energy is zero. And another interesting feature 
property of the uh, photonic dimer is that because, because of the relative one function also depends on the group velocity of the medium wherein it propagates. So its size, how tightly it's binded, actually can be tuned by changing, by modifying the group velocity. For example, in a typical photonic waveguide, say uh, a photonic two-dimensional waveguide, then the, this represents a typical uh, band diagram. So this is the photonic crystal. This is the waveguide wherein the diamond propagates. In this region, the group velocity is high, say 0.1 uh, velocity of the speed of light. And here it's flat, so the group velocity is zero. Then in this region, if, you, if we engineer the dimer at this frequency, then the uh, dimer size will be much, much smaller than that in this region. So in general, by tuning the band uh, diagram, we can change the size of the photonic dimer from a few nanometers to microscopic meter size. So this tunability is very unique. And uh, before I move on, so this probably is the only slide that contains mathematics. So when we perform a coincidence measurement, what we really probe is the relative wave function. For example, here represents the state of a two photon state. So here, this is the creation operator of the photon. Create one photon, create another photon. This is the wave function. When we perform the, the coincidence measurement, what we measure e effectively is that we annihilate two photon. We send in the light from here and through a beam splitter and each one arrive at a detector, and we measure the relative arrival, arrival time between the photons. By doing so, that actually is the probability of annihilating two photons at different places at different times. So this is the probability. So if you put the state into here, you will get that it actually is the uh, wave function. And if, if you express them as a function of the relative time, then this tells you the relative wave function. So essentially, uh, by performing a coincidence measurement, what you probe is the relative wave function. It's directly the relative wave function of the photonic dimers. And the people have done that. And the, here, this shows the uh, correlation function of some typical light. So this is the laser. We know that the laser, within the coherence time, the correlation function is flat. And for the SPDC, it's smooth, it's, most of the time it's a Gaussian, and the people have seen that. For a photonic dimer, because it probes the relative wave function, which it decays exponentially, so you will see a cusp, and the people have seen that. Uh, the photonic dimer represents a new quantum photonic state. It's a very different, it's a property, optical property. It's very different from, for example, an ultra short pulse. Here, I summarize some major difference between the two different light uh, sources. The photonic dimer is uh, always collocated, two photons are always collocated, and their energy is anti-correlated, meaning if the total energy is fixed, but if one has higher energy, another one will have lower energy. And the spectrum is Lorentzian. It is directly due to the uh, functional form of the relative wave function. On the other hand, for an ultra short pulse, the, the photons are independent to, uh, to each other. They obey the Poisson distribution. And uh, it can be built by, from the single photon state. And uh, each one is typically Gaussian. So the bandwidth actually is determined by single photon coherence time. On the other hand, for a photonic dimer, the bandwidth is determined by the width of the relative wave function. The photonic dimers 
we predicted that not just two photons, but any number of photons can form a bound state. I will tell you a little bit how you can generate that, the, those bound states. Right now, I just want to focus on the optical properties of these new quantum photonic states. So these new quantum photonic states has, uh, have been observed in cold atom systems. For example, in the photonic dimers have been observed in 2013. And uh, the photonic trimers was observed just very recently. So uh, I will briefly describe what they did in the cold atom system. So what they did is that they used uh, the readable bracket. So you have a cold atom. And then those atoms, those atoms are very stretchable. So if you excite one of them, it will be extracted to micron size, almost barely visible, micron size. And because the electron can extend too far away, in the end, it will prohibit, it, prohibit it other atoms to be excited because of due to the chrome energy. So in the cold atom, effectively, there will be only one active atom within a certain radius. So that means in the cold atom, when you properly uh, excite them, they will form a readable sphere. And each one, there's only one active atom. And they shine laser light in and interact with these active atoms. And they can observe, they can generate and observe the photonic bound states. So uh, before I discuss the applications, let me show you the, our theoretical predictions for these experiments and compare to the experiments. So for, for example, for the photonic trimer experiment, here the upper panel shows the third order correlation function and the, the a cut of the correlation function. These two are directly taken from the experiment, the paper. And the, the lower panel, panel shows our computational results. You can see the, the correlation function and the, the cross section, they are essentially identical. So we, we can obtain very good quantitative, quantitative agreement with the experiment. For this kind of nonlinear uh, optical experiment, the most important thing is uh, another important matrix is the nonlinear phase. So here, again, the upper panel shows the experimental results from the experiment uh, depicting the nonlinear phase. And then the lower panel it's our theoretical results. Again, you can see they are very good quantitative results. And the, the nonlinear phase means the following. For linear optics, if you have a photon going through some system and you gain a phase, if you have two photons going through it, then you just pick up twice the phase. If you have three photons, you just pick up three times the phase. That's a linear optics, and that's essentially what it, we see in almost every optical phenomena. But for, if you want to do some interesting things, you need to be able to generate nonlinear phase. That means for single photon going through it, it gets uh, pick up one phase. If you have two photons go through it, then it pick up another phase, and that phase is not two times of the phase of single photons. And that's what we call nonlinear phase. So the important thing to do interesting nonlinear optical phenomena is that you need to generate as different two photon phase as possible. And not just compute the correlation function. Our numerical technique allows us to compute, to generate the full scattering state with the wave function. With the wave function at hand, we can compute any uh, optical property of the system. And then it just shows that uh, we can do this in either dissipative regime or resonant regime. So 
the previous slides provide some simple overview for you to bring you to the context. So what does this photonic dimer do? I don't know why it's discolored. So in some sense, if I may draw an analogy, the photonic dimer, it provides a new, a new quantum photonic state. And uh, in some sense, it provides you a new different logo, uh, Lego pieces. Say you are asked to build a sphere out of ordinary Lego pieces, then this is roughly the best you can do, right? Because you are fundamentally limited by what you have. And if you are given some interesting Lego pieces with a very unique shape, then you can build a much better Lego sphere, right? So that's simple. So in some sense, the, this photonic dimer provides you a new pieces to do interesting things. And in the following, I'm going to tell you what interesting things we can do. So the first one is a deterministic two photon controlled uh, phase gate, control Z gate. Here is a very brief one slide to summarize what we need to understand this. So in quantum computing, people realize that, well, it, there exists a set of reversible universal quantum logic gate. And so that whatever complicated mathematical operations, they can always be decomposed into a series, a sequence of operations on this simple logic gate. And it turns out there are many different choices. And it turns out one of the choices is like this. We have a controlled Z gate, which is a two qubit gate. And we also have other three one bit gate, Hardmark gate, S gate, and the phase slip gate. So people have realized how to do this for a long, long time. And for different systems, for electronic systems, for many other systems, they can also do this. So the two qubit gate, there are multiple choices. One of them is control phase gate. It requires you to map the four states incoming four states into the outgoing four states in the following way. So three of the states are mapped into themselves. But fourth, there's a fourth state which is mapped into minus itself. So again, the whole purpose is that if you have these four simple states, one bit state, one bit gate, one bit gate, one bit gate, and a two bit gate, then in principle, any complicated mathematical operations can be decomposed into a series of operations on these simpler logic gates. So today, people already knew for a long, long time how to do this. But for this one, optically, today, people can only do probabilistic two qubit photon logic gate based upon linear optics and the post selection measurement using photo detectors. Okay. And then the yield in general is very low. The number depends on which specific scheme, so I won't uh, mention those numbers explicitly. And the, the most important thing is that the, the, implement, the implementation of this scheme typically is very challenging. You need to have many, many things match to, to make it. And again, the fundamental difficulty for realizing the two photon controlled Z gate and any other similar attempt is due to the lack of high efficient quantum nonlinearity at a single photon level. So here is a, a slide showing the uh, many different efforts on the quantum bit people have done. And the people have demonstrated two, photon, two qubit logic gate using many of these different type of uh, quantum bit. But in, in recent years, people start uh, being interested in photonic qubit because photons, it turns out they, are, they have very many unique properties and they are advantages uh, as a flying quantum bit. For example, photons provide high bandwidth and it's also possible to achieve very high bit rate using photons. 
And then in, compared to electronic counterpart or ion uh, counterpart, photons in general have a much longer coherence time. And they are also less sensitive to environment. And then they are also, they typically also have much lower dissipation and the low noise. And then they propagate much faster. And the more importantly, it's much easier to maintain the quantum entanglement between the photons than between electrons and the other possible quantum bits. So uh, in the following, I'm going to tell you how to generate the photonic dimers. And uh, uh, there are several ways. We come up with several different mechanisms. Here I'm going to describe one of them. And uh, to make a high efficiency, to generate the quantum dimers, the photon dimers with high efficiency, it turns out we need this configuration. And it's called chiral quantum optics. The basic idea is like this. The basic idea actually is very simple. So say we have a quantum dot, quantum dot, and there are two different uh, possible electronic transition. For example, they can be split by magnetic field. So one couple to one circular polarization, another couple to the reverse circular polarization. So if you design your waveguide, the normal waveguide, typical waveguide, but you design it such that in this propagation direction, it, the polarization in plane is in this direction. But in this propagation direction, the polarization is in this, they are time reversed. Then these were only coupled to one of them, and then these were coupled to one of them. So if you seed your quantum dot in these points, then even though the waveguide is a typical two-way waveguide, the photon will uh, only provincially uh, only propagate in one direction. And this is, we call, people call it quantum, chiral quantum optics. So uh, this scheme is much simpler than using the uh, photonic topological insulator, which should require you to modify the entire waveguide. And again, this is, this is much simpler. It's a typical waveguide, but you see the your quantum dot at some chiral point. So in the end, the photons only propagate in one direction. Now, using that, I will describe how to realize the two photon controlled phase gate. This is a photonic waveguide. Again, it's just a typical waveguide. It's not a photonic topological insulator. And then you see the, your quantum dot at the chiral point. Now you send in the photon. If the photon is on resonance with the quantum dot, then you will gain a pi phase shift, meaning when, you, when it's transmitted, it minus itself. It's a single photon state. But if the photon is off resonant, then essentially you won't interact with the quantum dot at all. So of course you won't pick up any phase. So the phase shift is zero. Then using this, people can construct, easily construct three two-bit state. For example, zero one state, meaning you send in two photons. One is on resonance. One is the off resonance. The off resonance photon does not interact with this, the, the, the quantum dot. And then the unwritten photon interact with it and the pick up a pi phase shift. So in the end, the outgoing state will pick up total of pi phase shift. And then likewise, this, the same thing happens if you have one zero state. They actually are the same. On the other hand, if you send in two of resonance photons, because neither of the photons will interact with the quantum dot. So the total phase shift is still zero. So these three actually are extremely trivial, right? The difficulty is that people knew this already, but the difficulty is that how do you come up with a fourth state such that it's different from these three? And uh, when you send in the system, the transmitted state gain a minus sign of itself. And that's a difficult part. It turns out, 
the photonic dimer. So the situation is uh, similar to what I described just now. So people are limited by what they have. So they were only given these three states. So they can only build a Lego sphere that is approximately uh, sphere, but not exact. And the, starting from here, many people propose all kind of all kind of approximate scheme to make it happen for the fourth state. And it turns out the photonic dimer provides you exactly the desired fourth state. The photonic dimer, I won't go into any mathematical detail, I will just describe it. And it turns out photonic dimer, if you send it in and it's transmitted, it will pick up a minus sign. And this state is not available previously because people didn't know the existence of this state. So they could only play with the three states and, it, and then came up with all kind of uh, approximate scheme to make it happen for the fourth state. And with the photonic dimer, it turned out it provides the exact fourth state to make this happen. And of course, the dimer is still different from the two unresonant photons. So now I'm going to show you that uh, they turned out to be very similar. So here we send in two unresonant photons. So the resonant photons, it's a one dimensional system. You send in two unresonant photons. The coordinate of the two photons are x1 and x2 respectively. And to help you to visualize the system, we plot it in the following way. We rotate one coordinate. So x1 is in one direction and x2 is in one direction. Again, in the physical system, there is a one dimensional system. So it's x1, x2. But to help you visualize, we rotate one coordinate. So now it becomes x1 and x2. So the input state, two photon flux state, in this kind of graphic representation, now it looks like a, a disk. So it comes in and encounter the quantum dot here. And here is the output. It turns out this is the dimer. And it, pick up, it picks up a pi phase shift. And these are two independent photons. And the phase shift is zero. So that means that means the output is essentially, essentially has a pi phase shift, but the pi phase shift is contaminated by the two uncorrelated photons. And the, the weight, the relative weight between the dimer and the disk gives you the fidelity. So that means if the output is mostly this, then the output give you a pi phase shift. So now we need to design, to engineer the system such that the output has as a higher weight of the dimer as possible. And it turns out to be possible. We scan the entire parameter space. Here is the results. So here, this basically uh, denotes the width of the input states. So it turns out if your input states in time scale, if the time scale corresponds to the spontaneous decay time of the quantum dot, then you can get a very high yield, which is close to one. That means if the, the size of the disk in time scale match, matches that of the, uh, matches the spontaneous decay time of the quantum dot, then the output will be essentially entirely photonic dimer and then therefore give you a pi phase shift. So that means this gives you exactly the fourth quantum state that people are looking for. And this also provides you a mechanism to generate photonic dimer. That means you build a photonic, uh, you design a photonic waveguide and then you see your quantum dot at the chiral point and then you pump it and then you, you, you don't need, there are many several mechanisms, and in this mechanism, you send in a photonic, uh, two photon flux state, and then the output will have very high fidelity to be photonic dimers. 
So with those understanding, here is a complete setup for the two photon controlled phase gate. So here is the, these two ports. One is the, these two are the input ports. One is control bit, one is target bit, and here is the coupled waveguide, which serves as a bin splitter, or in other terms, it actually is a H, uh, H gate. And so it scrambles the two incoming states, and each one goes through a chiral in, interact with a chiral atom, and then the output goes through an H gate again. Then you can check directly. Then for this setup, if you send in the four states in, again zero means unresonant photon, and the one means off resonant photon, then they will give you these, they will be mapped into these four states with exactly the property that people need for two photon controlled phase gate. So this is the first time that people can come up with a deterministic high fidelity two photon controlled phase gate. We proposed this last year, and for this work, we won the uh, NSF Raise Award last year. This work is uh, collaborated with Duncan Steele and the PC Cool at the U of Michigan. Now I want to discuss another interesting application of the photonic dimers. So some people, sometimes people say, we probably know more about the universe than our brain. Well, you know, this is just a slogan, right? Depends on your intent, what you want. But in any case, this means, indeed, we know very little about our brain. And then the reason is that we have telescope to look deep into the universe. So for example, you have read from the news, right? Just not too long ago, people can image a black hole that is 55 million light years away. And it turns out it looks like a donut. So the difficulty of this, people say, it's like photographing a golf ball on the moon. You see, people have this kind of technique, technology, to do this very difficult imaging. But on the other hand, we don't have any optical means that can look deep into our brain. The reason is that our brain and the biological tissue represent a turbulent biological uh, medium for light. So when the light comes in quickly, its be propagation behavior inside the uh, brain and the tissue becomes diffusive. Here is just some schematic representation. If you send the light in, then it will be scattered around and quickly it gives you the, the zigzag trajectory, collectively give you the diffusive behavior. And the quickly it loses the imaging power. It, the information carried by each photon is lost quickly. So in the end, people can only do this kind of imaging. They send the light in, and the most of light actually get lost. Some of them zigzag and uh, were lucky to come back to carry some information around here, and we can use those information to image the surface of the brain. And uh, uh, it turns out, using this technique, people can only image the brain at roughly 100 microns, okay? And uh, so that's like scratching the surface of the brain. But what we are interested in is to look deep inside the brain to image the neurons and the many other interesting uh, activities inside the brain. And because of that, people developed two photon excitation microscopy. Our brain represents a very turbulent medium for visible light. On the other hand, there's a very narrow transparent window for our brain, which is roughly, is roughly within this range. So people develop something called two photon excitation microscopy. They use, I'm going to call this red light. They use red light 
to, they can send the red light, which can penetrate because of the smaller scattering and absorption. So they can penetrate much deeper into our brain. And uh, they use the two photon excitation fluorophore such that the two photon can excite the fluorophore and then emit a fluorescent photon. And they can collect the, that photon to do, to do the imaging. The, the entire point is that the red photon can penetrate much deeper. So that means, in principle, we can image, deep, uh, image our brain and the tissue much, much deeper. But the problem is that this kind of two photon excitation, it requires the, the use of an intermediate virtual state. And those virtual state in general has a very, very short electronic uh, lifetime, roughly estimated at roughly 10 to the minus 15 seconds. So that means if you want to use this technique, you need to make sure that your two photons arrive together at the floor four to be able to achieve the two, two photon excitation, right? Because the lifetime is too short. You kick up the electron to the virtual state. Your second photon needs to come in almost immediately to bring the electrons back to the excited state. And because of this very stringent requirement, people use ultra-short pulses, ultra-short pulses, roughly at 100 femtoseconds. And they scramble, they put it in lots of in the, uh, independent photons with the hope that once in a while, two photons can arrive at the floor four at the same time. So in the end, people, So in the end, people can use this technology to image, for example, the mouse brain. And, uh, and it turns out and they can image this at roughly one millimeter, which is much, much smaller, one, at least one of the magnitude smaller than the penetration depth of each individual photons. And why is this so? Because in the end, how deep you can see is determined by, they are fundamentally limited by the signal noise ratio. So each individual photon can penetrate very deep. But then because of the excitation efficiency in this pro process is so low, so most photons are still single photons zigzag around. So in the end, the signal to noise ratio is so large, your signal is washed out by the noise. So in the end, even each individual photon can penetrate very deep to centimeter. People using the, the two photon excitation microscopy at this moment is still limited at roughly one millimeter. Again, the fundamental reason is the very weak photon atom excitation. And the, the low excitation can be understood in the following way. Well, as I said, the, in, uh, the intermediate virtual state has a very short lifetime, 10 to the minus 15 seconds. So you need to use ultra short pulses with a lot of photons. And sometimes, once in a while, two photons arrive together to make this transition. But if you temporarily compress the pulse, the bandwidth becomes much wider. They are independent. So in the end, on, so then each photon, the bandwidth becomes much wider. So only a small portion of the frequency component is used to make this transition. So in the end, you know that this will not be a very efficient process. But overall, com by combining time domain and the frequency domain, people still gain something. So they still use the ultra short pulse. And, but the low, the, the inefficiency is fundamental. It's uh, incompatible in classical optics. So that means there's no way to satisfy both the time constraint and the frequency constraint at the same time in classical optics. And uh, as I described uh, the previously, the properties of the photonic dimers overcome, address this issue naturally, right? The two, by construction, the dimers, two photons, always arrive together. 
and uh, their frequency entangled. That means energy anti-correlated. So if one energy is higher, another one is lower. So we know that it, for two photon excitation purpose, it can be much more efficient. Now the problem is that the issue is that how well we can engineer it and how efficient it is. So we spend some time on this, and here is the final result. So here is a comparison of different excitation scheme. For example, here shows a, a, a long pulse, temporary long pulse, and uh, these compare with the short pulse, 100, the short pulse, and also compare with the photonic dimer excitation. And uh, here, here is the uh, position of the intermediate state. For what interests us is around here, okay? So here plot the excitation efficiency compare uh, the excitation efficiency of different excitation scheme. Here shows the short pulse. Again, these are of interest to atom coherent control. But for the imaging purpose, what is interest uh, is this range. So here represents some common flow for used in optical imaging. And uh, the short pulse give you this uh, excitation efficiency. I didn't really give you the definition for the excitation uh, efficiency, but the whole point is that, well, you see, it's 10 to the minus 20. So that just means it's very small. And by using the photonic dimer, the efficiency is here. So it's at this six order of magnitude more efficient. So that means by using, as I said, we already knew that it's more efficient. The, this exercise is, we is, took us roughly six months to get this result. So the, this exercise just tell you that it's six order of magnitude more uh, efficient. So what this implies is that, well, because it's way more efficient, so the signal to noise ratio becomes much, 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 much higher. And that also means that it can image much, much, much deeper. When you put everything together, we estimate this technique will allow you to image the brain up to roughly four centimeters. And if we can make this light source, there will be a breakthrough. This will be the first time that people can achieve the deep brain imaging up to centimeter scales. And uh, this technique may also, ultimately, may also allow you to image individual neurons and their processes in vivo. So he, this slide is a comparison of the different uh, techniques for optical imaging. So here, the confocal, roughly several hundred microns. It just scratched the surface of your brain. And the, the multi-photon uh, excitation microscopy, roughly one millimeter. And the, by using photonic dimer, it can, pen, it can image roughly to several centimeters deep. So there's a chance that we may be able to optically detect the tumor and uh, many other cellular uh, processes in brain. So uh, related to this, another thing that we are pursuing now is the photonic dimer laser. So the, this represents, this light step represents a conventional laser. We know that a laser, the output, is a coherent state of single independent photons. So if, so to speak, we can quantum mechanically glue every two photons together, each one is a red photon with frequency omega. If we can glue them together like a dimer, then this composite object entity, it has a frequency two omega. So maybe for certain quantum processes, you will behave, act like a green photon, two omega green photon. So, and it turned out to be true. So now the interesting thing is, 
whether we can have some kind of quantum dimer laser such that the output is a coherent state of dimers. If, if we can do that, that means in some sense we can build the quantum nonlinearity at the light source level. Right now, the nonlinearity comes from the interaction between light and the material. But if we can achieve this kind of laser, that means we can build the quantum nonlinearity at the light source level. And that means for certain, when you propagate, it still maintain the property of each individual red photon. But when it gets to the target, then collectively, effectively, they behave like a green photon with frequency 2 omega. And uh, we have finished uh, some theoretical uh, investigation of this, and it turned out to be possible. We have some uh, design rules for this to happen. And uh, that means if we can uh, make this uh, laser, then you, we can construct a green photons using a green light laser using red photons. So this depicts some possible configuration for this kind of laser. So first, we have a slow light uh, waveguide. Slow light means that uh, they are much tightly binding to each other in the BC limit. And then you have the gain medium in the chiral system here. Then it, the entire structure is very similar to that of the typical laser. The only different mechanism is that instead of generate uh, one photon and then using stimulated emission to amplify, amplify the number of single photons, here we came up with a mechanism to amplify the number of dimers and then put in a slow light waveguide to maintain, maintain it, and then the output will be a, a coherent state of the photonic dimers. Okay, so with that, I basically uh, finished what I really wanted to tell you. I will use the remaining two minutes to give you some speculation on our very preliminary inv investigation on something called photonic uh, fluid. So we, when you put photon together, well, it's a state, uh, it's an equation of state, actually it's boring, right? So it's just a gas. Uh, but if you look around, many different, like high water molecule, they can exist in different state. They can exist in water state. They can exist in gaseous state. They can ex exist in solid state, right? So why photons do not have that kind of many internal states? So that's uh, our curiosity. So before that, let me sh we came up, we prepare a table for you to see. People have seen, have discovered or have seen all kind of different quantum fluids. I'll give you some definition for the quantum fluids later. And uh, for many of the discovery, in the end, they arrive at a Nobel Prize for these exotic states. So what is quantum fluid? Well, interesting, there's no exact definition of quantum fluid. So I will tell you what we mean by quantum fluid. It can mean several things. But what I'm going to describe shortly in one minute is that it, if you rotate, for example, if you rotate water and rotate quantum fluid, the response will be very different. If you rotate water, then if you look from above, the water will rotate, will rotate together, right? And you will see some kind of classical vortex. In the middle, it does not ro rotate. But uh, as, low, uh, as you go away from the center, the velocity becomes higher and higher and higher. And uh, we have seen this almost in many different occasions. If you swallow a coffee cup, a tornado, tornado a storm, and even a galaxy, they are just classical fluids, and here is the classical vortex. 
On the other hand, if you rotate a quantum fluid, what you will see is that, well, most of the region, they actually do not rotate at all, but they will create some quantized vortices. And uh, the angular momentum is quantized. And uh, these, together, these quantized vortices will take up the angular momentum that you give to the, to the system. And uh, so that only these are rotated. Ma the majority of the system actually does not rotate at all. So this is one manifestation of the quantum fluid. The, and the people have seen that in code atom. You code the atom, and then you use this light to rotate it, and the people see this kind of structure. So we wonder why photons cannot have this behavior. And here is some common, some argument people commonly propose to tell you why it's not possible for photons. They say photons do not have mass, and they have zero chemical potential, means that they can be destroyed, they can be, de can be generated, and they don't have charges, they don't inter interact with each other. Well, it turns out, of course, each one we can adjust individually. For example, you put photon in a waveguide, the dispersion curve determines the effective mass. So photon indeed can have mass, effective mass. And chemical potential, well, we can pump it so that on average, the mean photon number is fixed. Okay, so in that situation, maybe whether it has zero chemical potential or not does not really matter because it's in a pumped system. And also, Zero charge means the point is that they don't interact with each other. Well, as I said, it turns out you can create a medium, you can create a quantum photonic state, and then effectively they look like they are interacting with each other. So we can address each one individually. Does that mean combining them together, we can achieve some interesting quantum state of the photons? Well, we, we did some a little bit. But here, uh, I just want to tell you some uh, simple stuff. People have tried this. Uh, for example, they, in semiconductor and in cavity QED, there are several groups that are actively pursuing in this direction. They wanted to achieve a different quantum state for a collective, uh, for an ensemble of photons. And uh, uh, our belief mostly come from this. It turns out photon dimers and the Cooper pairs, they share some common properties. And uh, not just so, it turns out photon dimers are much more easy to be tuned. As I said, they can be tuned by engineering the group velocity. So that means it's much easier for photonic system to go from BEC system, meaning the two photons are very close to each other, or to the BCS regime, that means the two photons, they overlap with each other. So if a photonic system, it's much easier to go from BC limit to BCS limit. And putting everything together, we are interested to see whether we can engineer an ensemble of overlapping photonic dimers. And in the end, their low frequency behavior will be very, very different from that of a photonic gas. And we indeed, we did something, but because of the time, I think I will stop here. So to, uh, in this talk, I briefly described to you our work on a new quantum photonic state, photonic dimer, and uh, its applications. I describe its application in several different uh, fields, in quantum computing, the two photon logic gate, and uh, also in biological sciences, the, quantum, the possible quantum multi-photon excitation uh, microscopy. And uh, I also briefly tell you uh, whether it's uh, the, our uh, current work, whether it's possible to realize a quantum dimer a photonic diamond lasers, and also our speculations on whether a photonic liquid is possible. With that, I think I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you JT, uh, for an excellent and very interesting talk. Um, are there any questions? Aka?
I mean, how fast we can generate? Well, uh, we, in the past two years, we have investigated many, many different processes. One of them, which we are pursuing right now, is that we have one quantum dot and the seed it at the chiral point, and the, uh, the spontaneous decay time for the quantum dot, say it's one nanosecond. So we use one quantum dot, uh, we recycle it. So we generate a dimer, and we put, in, we, recycle, we put it in a fiber to maintain it. And then, when it, when the, uh, then after that, we can reuse the quantum dot again. So if it's uh, spontaneous emission time is say one nanosecond, that probably means you can recycle it optimistically. Ten, ten to the nine times in one second. So in. Right? So basically the photon that you're going to Yes so, yes, so that's why we recycle the quantum dot to avoid the uh, imperfection between different quantum dots. Even for the same quantum dot, all yeah. the quantum dot, the single photon that gets emitted from the quantum dot, they are not safe. Yeah. They, they are not indistinguishable, which is why quantum dot really did not find application in yeah, what you said currently is correct. So right now we are our uh, proof of principle attempt is to generate lots of dimers, and uh, even there are slightly different differences between each dimer that do not prevent the application I described at all. They can still be used that. that, that. So and uh, at this moment we are not pursuing a photon dimer laser. Rather we are trying to come up with some photon dimer LED. So it generates lots of dimers, and, we are, and each one may not be 100% uh, identical, but those are sufficient for the application we described. But in the future, if we want to have a very uh, uh, impactful application, then we need to have a con uh, photon dimer lasers. Well, I have a question. Um, so when you talk about the chiral photonics work, the quantum dots were embedded uh, in waveguide, and you, your illustration only show photonic crystal waveguide. Are there any possible waveguide structure for this? Yeah, for fiber, it's also possible. So the point is that the photon dimer, uh, photonic crystal is, uh, is, uh, has the advantages that you can design it in several ways. So you can engineer the polarization and the dispersion. No, for the fiber, if you can do the layer fiber, you can do similar things. For other uh, photonic waveguide, if you have less uh, tunability, then maybe it's not possible. Because for that, we really need circular polarization. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, let's thank the speaker again. Okay, thank you.